And now let us jump into semantics. I think if I uh, take the title uh, neoliberalism and neoconservatism into consideration, that many of you will be dissatisfied. I think we ought to go more basically into semantics. Now, this is an essentially European lecture by a European, by a European continental, which is very important to remember. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I, this little lecture will not be lacking in constant allusions to the American scene, or rather, to the American past because I do not want to deal with present day in, day out American politics, but rather with this republic uh, with a wider outlook and in greater generalities. Now, I was born, unlike, of course, most of you, there are a few exceptions, I was born the subject of a monarch, the tradition of this country, in its independence, of course, is a republican tradition. But bear here one thing in mind, and that is very, very important to remember, that after all aristocracies are usually have a republican inclination. In other words, aristocracies either like republics, in extreme cases always will form republics, because obviously, in a monarchy, they can only play the second fiddle to the king's first. We take the typical cases of Genoa and Venice. Sometimes they might like a relatively absolute monarch, but you remember what the old Prussian Juncker said, in der König absolut, wenn er unseren Willen tut. Let's, rule, let's, rule, let's give to the king an absolute rule or reign, provided he really carries out our wishes. In other words, aristocracies therefore either were downright republicans, they were in favor of elective monarchies, of monarchs elected by the aristocracy, the case of the Polish Republic, you see, or they won the monarchy where the king's power was something very shadowy and not really effective as we have seen in the whole constitutional development of Britain. And of course, this country here, as you all know very well and well realized, was essentially an aristocratic republic. I do not say a republic of a nobility, but certainly an aristocratic republic. And you are quite aware of the fact that this is an aristocratic republic if you go to Washington, D.C., and there you find in front of the White House, you find Jackson Square, in Jackson Square, right in the middle, is the monument of Old Hickory, called himself a Democrat, and yet really got into the White House. But in the four corners of Jackson Square, you see the four monuments, the four European noblemen who came to this country to fight for the great aristocratic ideal, which naturally is not equality, but which is liberty. Tadeusz Kosciuszko, Baron von Steuben, the Comte de Rochambeau, and the Marquis de Lafayette. Count Pulaski is, you know, the only general of the Union who lost his life, has his monument in Savannah, and the noblest of them all, the finest of them, the real witness, let us say to my thesis, Armand Tuffin, Marquis de la Rouerie, has no monument whatsoever in the United States. As a matter of fact, he is terribly unknown, and yet this man came to this country before Lafayette, he stayed in this country until after Lafayette, he was a personal friend of George Washington. He was a member of the Order of the Cincinnati. And then finally he went back to France and there he saw the menacing dark clouds of democracy arise. And so he wrote to his friend George Washington that he really planned to return to the United States to escape democracy, to remain a free man. But since he was a devout Christian, a man with great religiosity and devotion, he realized his real duty was to stay where he was and to face the music. And then he organized the resistance in Brittany, the Chouanry, the second part, the one was in the Vendée, and there in Brittany, while in hiding, while organizing, together with an American friend, Major Schaffner, and with his beautiful cousin, who, to whom he gave the, on a ribbon the order of the Cincinnati, and who acted as his messenger on a black stallion 
he died while he was in hiding in the castle, La Guillaume Marais. Probably he had meningitis. The Jacobins closed in on him. They co of course, they couldn't find him in the castle. They finally made the butler drunk. The butler told the truth that he was there, that he had died, that he was buried. They dug him up. They decapitated his corpse and rubbed his decaying head into the face of the countess who owned the castle. Needless to say, the whole family was guillotined. His cousin also, she cut her own hair off. She refused very manly to accept the uh, consolation of a priest who had given an oath on the constitution, perjurer in her eyes, and so these people went down. But I mentioned our mon de la Rouerie, you see, because that man had come to this country here and had really fought for freedom, for the ideal of liberty, had then gone back to France and had fought against democracy. He was a genuine liberal, he was therefore an anti-democrat. Now, I have already brought in two pieces of semantics. Now, what is really democracy? Because since everybody talks about it, of course, naturally, nobody knows what it means. And what is liberalism, genuine liberalism, as it is understood on this white globe, but I must say, unfortunately, misunderstood in this country here. Now, democracy really is a purely political term. It answers the question, who should rule? And the answer it gives is the majority of politically equal citizens, either in person or through their representatives. In other words, you cannot say, let's just say, a millionaire, Mr. Green Pimple, who has a colored chauffeur and calls him by the first name and he calls his master by the first name, they sit down together in the drugstore. That man is demophile, but he is not necessarily democratic. Monarchs, absolute monarchs, very often have been demophile, but an absolute monarch cannot be democratic. So you see, these terms mean power, kratos, and this is a strong power. This is not ache, as you find it in monarchy. You see, this is strong power of the people. Majority rule and political equality. Whereas liberalism, rightly understood, does not answer the question who should rule, but how should government be exercised? And the answer it gives is, regardless of who rules, government and rule must be exercised in such a way that each individual enjoys the greatest amount of personal liberty of course, well understood, the greatest amount of personal liberty still compatible with the common good. Now that is liberalism. Now, you see, in this sense, of course, Jesus, to tell you, because I think you all know, the Founding Fathers were not Democrats, but the Founding Fathers were liberals. As a matter of fact, it is very questionable whether we can even glibly and easily speak about Jeffersonian democracy. Because Jefferson, if you read his collected works, and there's a lot to be read, you see, because after all they are enormous, only towards the end of his life, should we say in his dotage, one said in a letter, as a matter of fact, you might call me a Democrat. But this was the only time. The man, of course, uh, was really the Jeffersonian outlook is really a republic of free yeomen, a republic of land-owning farmers and led by the natural aristocracy, by an aristocracy of achievement, of course, rather than of birth. But George Washington, of course, was violently opposed to democracy. So was John Adams. Of course, we had the harshest word about democracy. So was Madison who said fairly prophetically, once we have democracy in this country, private property would not be secure any longer. A real uh, anti-democrat was Gouverneur Morris. A man like Fisher Ames was naturally a radically anti-democrat. So all these men who were liberals, who were interested in personal liberty, were not really interested in equality. And this is the reason why, when the American Republic came into being, 
the enthusiasm in Europe was amongst the nobility and not at all amongst the common man. You see, that experience is a matter of fact, we can go even a little step further back and say there was no initial hostility of the founding fathers against the monarchical principle either. If you ever read the Declaration of Independence, because I'm absolutely certain that you all know the preamble by heart, but I'm not quite sure whether you also read, read as you also read the insurance policy, the fine print, that you really discover that the phrase about George III, a prince not fit to be the ruler of the free people. And very often, slyly and sadistically, I speak about the rulers of free people until somebody lifts his hands and says, Sir, you misunderstand our whole mind. A free people rules itself. It has no ruler. It governs itself. And then I say, well, wait a moment, where did I get this phrase from? I got it from the Declaration of Independence. Because as Francis Lee already said, it points out that this particular person, this man George III, had not the qualities to be the ruler of a free people. Because we just to say, we all live unruled. There is no escape. There is no self-rule. This is an illusion. With the fall and with original sin, the government has become a government, a forceful government, with authority and power, and with coactive resources has become our fate. And it is only a sort of curious effort to get around original sin and have a paradisiacal utopian notion that we can rule ourselves. On uh, April the 15th, when you write out your income tax declaration, you'll be very much aware of the fact that you are being ruled. And of course, who rules? The majority rules. The majority rules, and of course, its representatives, even over the minority who never voted for it. You see, in democracy, there is a certain aspect. It reminds me very often of nudism. Nudism, you see, is another effort to get around the original sin. The idea being, if we only take our clothes off, our sexual problem will be solved, and as you know very well, it isn't solved in Japan at all. We have to face our human frailties, and we have to face our condition humaine, our, our, human, uh, our human situation. The United States Constitution, of course, naturally was built up, as you know very well indeed, as a regime and mixed form, and thereby does really belong to the great Western tradition. Mixed government in which monarchical and elitarian and also democratic elements, of course, are mixed. If you look, for instance, at the Swiss Constitution, this is a far more ancient tradition. The Swiss tradition, of course, is a new constitution of 1878, but the far more ancient tradition, the monarchical element is really lacking. Uh, the Swiss president is only for one year the chairman of the cabinet, and his name very often is not even known by an educated Swiss in all the public offices, never ever. When you see his picture, by that of the commanding general, Switzerland is a military democracy. And this is also the reason, you see, all the men have to serve up to the age of 47 every year. And this is also the reason why the women get no vote, because their argument is, well, they don't serve in the army, and he who doesn't serve in the army is not fully a citizen. It's an armed camp. Uh, it's not a cuckoo clock. It really is a completely different proposition. And it's a very tough society in a very tough little state. But the founding fathers, naturally, who were so violently opposed to democracy, they only shared an opinion which was widespread about Europe. In all the great writings, the term democracy was taken in its classic sense, as used by Plato, as used by Aristotle, and there were also the two terrifying pictures of the two persons who had been killed, who had been murdered by democracy, and the death of these two persons, one a philosopher and one a god, these two deaths really are the two great pillars of Western history. That is Socrates and our Lord Jesus Christ. Socrates, uh, I'm quite sure you know something about Socrates. You have heard that the main accusation was the corruption of youth. But uh, what this corruption of youth really means, there was absolutely not the slightest sexual implication. 
The corruption of youth was the political corruption of youth. Socrates ridiculed democracy. Socrates cited Homer, Ukagaton, Polykoiranie, Heis Koiranos Esto. In other words, he made monarchist propaganda. And that was the that was the crime of Socrates. I have never ever found an American textbook in which this was really mentioned. If you don't believe my words, look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica on the Socrates in the eleventh edition. And the other man was our Lord. It was our Lord who fell in the hands of a very pitiful person, and that is an agnostic liberal. I using this word liberal so in the European sense, in the classic sense. A man who did not believe the truth was attainable. Because when our Lord says, I have come to be witness of truth, then Pilate asked him, Ti esti aletheia. What is truth? And without waiting for an answer, he passes, Jesus Christ walks out to the balcony, sees the howling mob. And of course, they demand his death. You consult the people. I mean, you're counting notes. See, because either you have a concept of truth, this is true and this is untrue, or if this, then you may count your buttons. You see, this is one way, uh, you throw dice, put cards down, or you count those consent. Forty million Frenchmen can't be wrong. Forty million can, Frenchmen can be very wrong indeed. In 1932, 60% of the Germans voted for slavery. You see? I mean, the counting of doses doesn't give us any clue as to true or untrue, as to just or unjust. But you see, these pictures were strong in Europe. These concepts, democracy. I mean, finally, when Aristotle fled Athens and he packed his suitcases, luckily he didn't send them to the on airlines, of course, to Sajara. Uh, his reaction was, I'm trying to escape the fate of Socrates. They are going to be after me. Public opinion is going to mourn me again. I'm again going to stand on the aerial pad. But you see here now, we must step, take a step further, because what interests us really is this issue. Liberty, the principle of liberalism, rightly understood, and democracy. What sort of human drives are there embodied? Then, of course, we are going to explain the phases of liberalism. Democracy is an iron principle, but liberalism has its phases and its metamorphosis. We all have two drives. The one drive in it's all of us is towards identity, the other drive for diversity. We may be in situations, in moods, we want to be together with people of our own age, our own convictions, our own faith, our own sex, our own background, our own class. We enjoy identity. And then there is another drive which is a romantic drive. No, we want to be together with people of another sex, of another conviction. We want to travel. We want to hear music we never heard before. If we want to eat food we have never eaten before. We are antagonistic to repetition. And do not forget this, this drive for diversity, this hunger for something new, for a change, this readiness to establish a difficult contact across oceans, across boundaries, that this is a drive which is purely human. Because the simple gregariousness is on an animal level. You might give to the dog every evening the same sausage, and he shows you full gratitude. But every evening the six, six inch porter house steak after all is for lunch, also and for breakfast, of course, finally, even steak would be too much fun. We want diversity. This is human. And there lies in the acceptance of diversity a real magnanimity. The life there even a certain virtue. But you see here, democracy is really identitarian. There is an identitarian element, and this identitarian element has become something frighteningly dominant in our modern civilization. 
Of course, it starts with the archaeological revival of democracy through the French Revolution, through a man like Rousseau, and then finally also to a man who is insufficiently explored as a diabolical, political genius and philosophical genius, the Marquis de Sade. Because usually he's only known for the perversion, his perversions. But in his, in his work, there's a colossal amount of politics. He is actually, and this is the interesting little sidelight about it, uh, which is an interesting sidelight, he's the man responsible for the storm of the Bastille. More or less, I mean, what is the evidence uh, to that? The evidence is that he was locked up in the Bastille until your national holiday. That means until July 4th, 1789. There was a ferment in Paris. And with the help of a funnel, he shouted to the people, an innocent man is being held here. July 2nd, July 3rd. He threw little pieces of paper with the same words, come and liberate me, an innocent man is held back in the Bastille. So they find in the whole quartier, the feeling spread, the feeling was said as an innocent man there. Because do not forget, the Bastille has not been used for political prisoner already for a long, 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 long time. De Lomé, the uh, governor of the Bastille, desperately wrote to the Minister of the Interior, we all have the letters, you see, what shall I do with this man? I mean, he's really dangerous. He should really go to the place where he belongs to Charentin, to the hospital of the criminally insane. And actually, on July 4th, he was transported to Charentin. But you see, the sermon was there. Ten days later, the Bastille is being stormed. The poor old veterans are massacred. There are only four forges there in the Bastille, two insane people for observation, and a dissolute young man who had been locked up upon the request of his family, as was the case of the Divine Marquis. The Divine Marquis was then finally liberated from the hospital of the criminally insane, and uh, as a lot of criminally insane people in our days too, became a great local political leader in Paris, the Section de Pique. Now, let us let us forget a moment now, the Marquis de Sade. You see, this revival of ideologies which are essentially identitarian, this revival, you must see democracy being really buried with democratic essence, buried under the debris of the Macedon leadership and the Macedonian rule, finally comes back an archaeological revival. After the American War of Independence, I would never say the American Revolution was not a revolution, it's an American War of Independence. The French Revolution is a revolution. But in the French Revolution, in a forest of guillotines, the great cry, the great dramatic force of envy, the great dynamism of identitarianism, la république une, indivisible, and in this republic one and indivisible, all people should be the same. It's a, it's a pity that the final plans were not carried out. Already there was a plan to have a uniform, a civilian uniform for every Frenchman and every Frenchwoman. There already was the decree signed by Robespierre that all the powers of all the, all the spires of all the churches ought to be demolished because they contradicted the principle of equality. And one church in Best of Chandes already they destroyed the church tower. The decree was also accepted already by the, uh, by the Commune of Strasbourg. They were quite ready, luckily, of their fell. But you see the one. The vision is always a country of one language, one race, one class, and preferably one income. Maybe finally of one sex. I mean, we see tendencies nowadays already. Uh, if you keep your eyes open. Of one age. Uh, old people dressing up like youngsters. In other words, the fear of difference. And to view the person who dares to be different, any nonconformity uh, is something criminal. Now whether it's democracy, nationalism, socialism, national socialism, fascism, communism, this oneness, this hatred against differentiation is immensely strong and really, so to say, paralyzes the masses. Uh, Lord, uh, his Lordship, 
uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, who could not possibly be declared to be a thinker of the right, but a thinker of the left. In his ideal of happiness, he emphasizes the fact that after all the driving force in democracy, the driving force in it is envy. Nobody should be better than I am. But immediately there is the thought of suspicion, if you are different, maybe therefore you think thereby uh, you are better. I had a curious experience uh, almost 30 years ago, 29 years ago. I, I was an innocent in this country here. I, you know, somebody said, I asked somebody, well, what is he like? And he said, uh, well, I mean, he's a fellow like you and me, of course. And I said, quite innocent. They said, look at me now, a fellow like you, a fellow like me. The immediately the reaction was, you think I'm better than I am. Because, of course, you see, to me it was unthinkable who were different. You see, but fellow like you and me, and there is no such thing. Because we human beings, we are basically unique and only in our contortion, in our disfiguration, we become identical, we become a crowd, uh, we really become a mass. But now, when I speak about the liberal principle, the principle of freedom, the hunger of freedom, the hunger to be uninhibited, the desire to achieve one's real development of one's personality was, of course, always there. But only was about the end, again, of the 18th century, it received a certain ideological profile. But these, this yet uh, to liberty, uh, liberalism rightly understood, as it is understood by the Mont Pelerin Society, as it is understood by the World Liberal Federation. A self-appointed American liberal, I mean those who profess to be liberal nowadays, their vast majority, would be inacceptable to them. Also there are some Americans, well I think about Milton Friedman for instance as an example, uh, who still insists I am a liberal and the rest of course have no right, and he's right on that, and the rest has no right to call themselves liberal. I was, and old enough, I have known an America which most of you have not known, because I lived in this country in the 1930s. And this was the time when the term liberal actually became perverted. And I contributed an article in the old American Mercury, at that time under the editorial leadership of Eugene Lyons, and he ran a series, and there was, for instance, creed of a conservative creed of a democrat, then came the creed of a liberal, and then came, and that was written by Oswald Garrison Villard, creed by an old-fashioned liberal. And what he called old-fashioned liberal, that was genuine liberalism. So it was during the New Deal that the word liberal completely changed its meaning. Because obviously, Liberalism in Europe, a liberal party, would naturally always be a party of the right. Now let us say, for instance, give an example now, the Liberal Party of Italy today. The Liberal Party of Italy sits on the right side of the chamber, between the Democristiani, between the right wing of the Democristiani, and the monarchists. And of course, actually, quite a number of liberals are monarchists. Monarchism is very well compatible with liberalism. The question is, is really democracy? Uh, I want again to go back a little bit to make it absolutely crystal clear what the difference is. These two concepts, democracy and liberalism, belong to different categories, just like round and white. Now, a billiard ball can be round and white. Now, that would be a liberal democracy, you see. But roundness can be applied to a globe. And whiteness can be applied to a world. And when I say that many of them are monarchists, well, uh, obviously, because democracy, yeah, the crisis is a very strong form of government. This is already a step towards totalitarianism. If, of course, finally liberty and equality, are they really compatible? If you look at nature and we want to have equality in nature, don't we have to dynamite the mountaintops and fill the valleys? In hope. Imagine a class and uh, the director would say, of the school, the principal, in this subject, everybody should get a B grade. Everybody should have a B grade. Well, the result would be. 
And if I could feed the goat, then you're going to get to feed all of these. One time in 1898, Karl Burkhardt, Jakob Burkhardt, and then finally Lord Acton. Burkhardt, of course, is, is a real patrician of the city of Bari. And But these thinkers who are liberals and emphasize personal liberty, their mind is not hooked, you see, predominantly on economics, but on politics and on social theory. And these men, of course, insist that man must be free out of their religious background. I mean, they see man endowed with an immortal soul. And this sort of destiny which man has to fulfill because God wants man free. I mean, this is their message. This is early liberalism. Now, these periods do not come one neatly after the other. They overlap. He think of all this overlap. So pre-liberalism and early liberalism overlaps, and of course early liberalism and old liberalism and paleoliberalism overlap. Now paleoliberalism, whereas the early liberals are very anti-democratic, very skeptical of democracy, fearful of majority rule, almost especially Burkhardt having, and, and the talk really different ways, Burkhardt have almost a vision of the coming of the Nazis. Because never forget, you see, the Nazis, of course, they call their system eine deutsche Demokratie, a German democracy, just as, as Lenin calls it, Demokratia von Nordenu, a democracy in the new fashion. And Mussolini speaks about fascism, about una democrazia organizzata, an organized democracy. I mean, they operate with the masses and for the masses and with an appeal to the masses in the majorities, and they really are democratic in as much as they could prove, in as much as we can get that they were followed at times, in certain periods, really and truly by the majority. But then, with this skepticism of democracy, the old liberals who are agnostics, the old liberals who are anti clerical the old liberals who attack Christianity very often indeed, because they are afraid of any dogmatic stand. All liberals are for toleration. But the old liberals are really convinced that you can only be truly tolerant provided you have no firmly grounded views. The old liberal really likes the attitude to say, I think I'm right in my own ways, and also you differ from me, you're right in your ways, you're both right and wrong, let's make it 50-50. Because it would be delightful, I've never listened to it, but I could imagine a wonderful conversation between an old liberal and a Nazi. The Nazi says, we want to exterminate six million Jews, and the old liberal says, no, not a single one, and then they make it 50-50 and exterminate three million Jews. And so you see here the ruthlessness. You see, here's Pilate, he is the Aletheia. We are going to count noses. But the old liberal, again, harking back, to the pre liberals are very economically minded. They are for a radically free economy. Whereas the final stage in which we are now, and I would cite men like Ruyat, Villa, uh, 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 Röttke above, Wilhelm Röttke, extremely well known in this country, Alexander Risto, totally unknown, Alfred Müller Armack, totally unknown, Louis Rouget, quite unknown. You see, it's interesting, the only really known man in this whole group I could name would be uh, Wilhelm Röttke, whose books have been published by the, mostly by the, uh, partly by the Chicago University Press, partly by Regner. You see, and these men are now harking back to the early liberals. Now you see, here's the relationship. Pre-liberals and old liberals, early liberals and neoliberals. You see, here's the tie-in of the faith. Now, economically, of course, the neoliberal is for an entirely free economy, entirely for laissez-faire, against government intervention, but with one exception. You see, here they differ from the old liberals. They are trustbusters. They say, no, we are against monotism and colossalism. Competition must be kept alive. This is the economic problem. Therefore, the monopolization deprives the customer from his free choice. 
Therefore, that since we believe in competition, competition must go on. And no, no state monolith should exist. And on the other hand, of course, no enterprise monolith should exist. The neoliberal, again, is very skeptical of democracy. The neoliberals, of course, have seen the frightening horrors of Nazism. They have seen that a nation as literate as the Germans, that under certain circumstances, with a certain economic pressure, with a certain ressentiment, with a brilliant demagoguery, you can bring in majorities to vote for tyranny. They know very well indeed that democracy is a mere frame. And through elections, through majorities, into this frame, you can hang all sorts of pictures. Well, obviously, neoliberalism is a form, a political form of the right, not of the left. Now, we have finally come to the delightful question, what is right? What is left? And I think in this piece of semantics, the greatest deal of nonsense, the greatest deal of confusion actually rules. Identitarianism and leftism, diversitarianism and rightism. Coercion, pressure, collectivism, determinism, massification, you see, unitarianism, centralization is left. Freedom, personality, free development is right. Genuine liberalism is right. And leftism is left and wrong. You see, this terminology right and left This terminology of right and left is an ancient, in a sense, humanly, psychologically, an ancient. You see, it's biblical language. On the right are the people who are right, rightly so. In Germany it sounds better. Gerecht, recht, redlich. And the left is gauche. <laughs> On the left are the damned. Rise ye damned of the earth, the old beginning lines of the international. We are the left, we are the damned. Here's the no, here's the negation, here's the zero, here lies nihilism. And the right, of course, is for the person's freedom. Because you see, how often have you heard, I'm quite sure many of you have heard that, as I have heard that, well, we're against all extremism, not the extreme right and the extreme left, because after all, Extremes always meet in extreme right and extreme left becomes practically identical. They say, how did you come to this conclusion? Well, wouldn't you admit that the Nazis and the communists are almost identical? Yes, indeed, I admit that immediately. But why are they identical? Because they're both on the left, of course. Because they're both anti-elitarian, because they're both for identity, because they hate freedom, because they hate differentiation, Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. One, 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 one in both. Obsessed by the oneness both. Extremes never meet. Extremely cold and extremely hot. Extremely tall and extremely small. They're always opposites. They never meet. Anybody says opposites meet, I mean, just doesn't know, just doesn't know the simplest laws of logic. They don't meet. You see, all Nazis, they all are from really, whether it's the guillotine or the gas chamber uh, or the shot in the nape of the neck, this is all one enormous tradition. And Hitler proudly has said, we are the executors, the German executors of the French Revolution. Goebbels has spoken in very, very similar terms. I mean, they have spoken all with the language of the left. Their flag is the red flag. Don't forget that. You see, this is a biological determinism. They come from the lab. They do not see man as man, they see man as animal. And as you can crush a bad bug, you can crush a Jew or a Pole or a Gypsy or anybody who is in your way. This is strange materialism. And of course the materialist left, if all the materialisms are on the left and, 
And in a sense, all the spiritualities are on the right. And now, a word about conservatism. You see, I'm a man of the extreme right. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an arch-liberal, a man of the extreme right. I do not call myself a conservative. In this country here, I would always cooperate with all genuine conservatives. Because, I mean, these are the people naturally nearest to my outlook and my heart. But I said now, a genuine conservative. You see, I mean, there are, there are false conservatives too, you know. Uh, old conservatism, and I know, we know this from our European experience. You see, conservatism as an ism only really finally arises in Europe in the early 19th century. And of course, European conservatism had to fight what they called always la révolution, the revolution. And by this they meant the French Revolution, and all its ramifications. The socialism was finally one. Your political equal, you should be materially equal. And you know, here's the enormous danger. If you put your sight entirely on an enemy, if you fight him from early morning to the late evening, you start to think like him. Because if he attacks in this way, you have to move in this way. If he attacks that way, you have to move in that way. In a sense, the enemy finally determines your movement. Not necessarily so, but the danger is there. You see? And the old conservatives had fallen prey to the danger and had really taken, and I speak now about the old conservatives in Europe, into their program all sorts of ideas which were really leftist ideas. For instance, they were nationalists. A real conservative is not a nationalist. He's not Neither is he an internationalist, but he is a supranationalist. With a certain grace, he reaches out to other nations, honors their qualities, of course saying, since I'm the son of my own people, since I'm the son of my own country, my loyalty obviously belongs to it, but this doesn't God prevent me also from seeing qualities in others. You see, the real conservative, genuine conservative is never a nationalist. He's a patriot, something quite different. You see, the patriot has a patria. He has a fatherland. As a matter of fact, he would be proud. He would say, you know, in my fatherland there are so different races. There are so different nationalities. There are so different customs. It is so rich in form. And of course, only the leftists would come and say, now we have to uh, exile this minority. Or we have to eliminate these differences. We have to make a unitary concoction out of the whole. See, this is the downfall of the old Austro-Hungarian monarchy, the rise of nationalism, of Czechoslovakia, the rise of Czech nationalism. We don't want the Soviet and Germans to expel them. In other words, this unitarism. A real conservative delights in multiformity. You know, the founder, the real founder of Hungary, Saint Stephen, King of Hungary, wrote in his will to his son, Saint Emmerich, and he said to him, and I give that to you first in Latin, Unius lingue uniusque moris regnum fragile et imbecile est. And that means a kingdom of only one language and one custom is a fragile and stupidly feeble thing. And this is a language which modern man, who after all has been infected thoroughly by leftist notions. You see, he wouldn't accept that. And remember how in this country, a very leftist small movement which has, I think, completely disappeared, or almost completely disappeared, the technocrats. When the war broke out in 1941, their program was to put all Americans, all men and women, into uniform, to give each one of them $60 a week, and also to abolish the entire foreign language press. You see, this is a wonderful leftist program. Of course, as a communist, of course, in this sense, it was a great push-off program uh, to have, by 1980, 90% of all children from the six, age of six onwards in boarding school. That is, that is a wonderful leftist vision. But the conservative loves a variety, and he is not a nationalist, he's a patriot. And he is not a militarist, but of course he's not a pacifist either. 
You see, conscription is an evil which unfortunately we have to take on us because the great enemies of freedom also have conscript armies. But it's not an ideal situation. The ideal situation is an army of volunteers, army of people who have a real vocation to fight. You see? You might, and it's interesting, uh, the feeling that they're mercenaries. Well, of course, they're supposed to do something because after all, even the draft of commission officer gets the thing. You see, in other words, a man who, for a general and for a flag, the volunteer, the army, an army of professionals, he who has really the vocation, of course, a dream today, I know, under the circumstances. So the, 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 the only, we can only progress through the acceptance of our heritage, eliminating here and there something wrong, of course not. That has to be done. There are sometimes very old and very evil things, but certainly building up. And that is the conservative outlook. And the other thing, of course, is the love for freedom. And the European conservative was a man who finally, fighting socialism, fighting communism, fighting this and that, was a man who, listening to the word liberty, the word liberty sounded almost evil in his ears. Isn't there some little something anarchic about that? What we need is discipline. Oh yes, what we need is also discipline, but we also need freedom. And after the enormous persecution which conservatives have suffered in Italy, but above all in Germany, and in Austria. The conservatives have really woken up to the fact that liberty is really not something evil, it really is something absolutely essential. How often the word liberty is mentioned in the New Testament, Echten Eleuterian, Eleuteresa Terimar, Galatians, you see. There's no talk about equality in the New Testament. We are all totally, we are all unique and therefore totally unequal and have only to emphasize this in Christian colleges and universities. We are by no means equal in the eyes of God. By no means. Only since we do not know who is superior to whom, we treat each other. This is a procedure. We treat each other as brothers and sisters, but we are not equal. Because if you say that Judas Iscariot and St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist were equal, well, we feel shocked. And Christianity makes no sense. God doesn't love us equally. He gives, to, according to Catholic doctrine, He gives to everybody sufficient grace to be saved, a sufficient minimum. But Christ loved St. John more than He loved St. Peter, but to St. Peter He gave the keys. You see, we are not equal in the eyes of God. We are all different. Thank God we are all different and we are all unique and everybody of us is irreplaceable. Nobody is indispensable is a purely nihilistic slogan. Everybody is indispensable. You see, here lies the reverence for the human person. But finally, you can imagine how the new conservative in Europe and the neoliberal have become people with almost identical programs that in Europe the new liberal and the new conservative are almost indistinguishable or are practically indistinguishable. Or that the man from one camp will write for the periodicals of the other camp and you can't even divide the camps any longer. The conservatives accept freedom and the liberal accept tradition. Both accept religious values. The conservatives always did, betrayed them very often, but he always did it on principle. And the liberal now realizes, this is really touching if you read the work of this, in, of this really brilliant German liberal, Alexander Risto, who only died about three years ago, where in his Ostbestimmung der Gegenwart, a book which is vastly superior to in the study of history. But since it doesn't exist in English, it is only known inside the German community, but will in a few years be published in English. Where he, a man who has no faith, where in four pages he really addresses agnostics and atheists, and he said, you, that means really we, because he belongs to them, we've got to shut our mouth. We have nothing to go on. We have nothing to offer. Everything we really enjoy, everything which is dear to us, 
friends of freedom, finally, fundamentally, have to be grateful to Christianity. Have to be grateful to the Judeo-Christian tradition. You see, that is the language of the new liberalism. And of course, as you can see, even from that, how radically different from the American context. So much about the semantics. And I do hope now, without going into the perspectives of the future, maybe they come up in our discussion, that you might ask me about the prospect, development, uh, all such answers are always going to remain highly speculative. It is much, much easier to look into the past. Thank you so much.